The gentleman from California is now recognized for one hour. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And let me say how great it is to see you uh, in the chair, and I, I wish you well. Um, Mr. Speaker, for the uh, purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to my very good friend from, from Worcester, uh, pending which I yield m myself such time as I might consume, and Gentleman I ask unanimous consent to revise and uh, extend my remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Um, and I already said that all time will be yielded for debate purposes only. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> let me say that, uh, as I just mentioned in my, in my one minute, it's very gratifying that as we look at this election, we have uh, many people who have used the term mandate to describe what it is that they have gotten. The President says that he has a mandate to increase taxes. Some Republicans say that we have a mandate to not increase taxes. And lots of people throw this word mandate around. And I, I believe that the mandate is for us to focus on job creation and economic growth. And while we still embrace the Madisonian vision of a clash of ideas, that's a very, very important notion put forward by the author of the U.S. Constitution. At the end of the day, it's important for us to do something, and I think that the mandate from the election is that the American people want us to do everything that we can to create jobs, get the economy growing, and deal with many of the societal challenges that we face. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why I say it's very gratifying that the first item out of the chute after the election is something that we're going to be able to do in a bipartisan way. Not that it hasn't been controversial. And I will admit, Mr. Speaker, that there is controversy that surrounds this issue, and I'm going to talk about it. But I will say that it's great that we'll be able to do something with Democrats in the House, Republicans in the Senate, in, in, in the House, Democrats in the Senate, Republicans in the Senate, and the President of the United States on the same page in support of Russia's accession to the WTO and, most particularly, the opportunity for the United States of America, our workers, to have access to 142 million consumers uh, in that country. So, Mr. Speaker, um, on August 22nd, Russia became a member of the World Trade Organization. Again, uh, a huge economy. In fact, the last large economy, large economy to actually become a member of the WTO. And um, that's a good thing. It's a good thing because Vladimir Putin is not a good guy. It's a good thing, Mr. Speaker, because we are going to, not only with accession to the WTO, but also with the multifarious provisions that have been included in this measure, calling on the United States Trade Representative, calling on the State Department, calling on other entities to focus on things like intellectual property violations, negotiations, sanitary and phytosanitary agreements, the information technology agreement, the government procurement agreement. There are a wide range of provisions in here that will force Russia to live with a structure that it does not have today and will not have until we take this very important action. Now, one of the reasons that I've been such a strong proponent of this issue has to do with a name, and it's not the name that we're going to be talking about in a minute. The name is Mikhail Kordakovsky. Mikhail Kordakovsky is a businessman who um, was jailed and at this moment is incarcerated on a se in the midst of a seven-year additional extension of his crime for so-called tax evasion. Now, I'm, I mention those two words as to explaining why I'm here, uh, because uh, I met Mr. Kodakovsky, who was uh, the head of Yukos Oil and widely respected, I'm sure a tough businessman, but widely respected and a great philanthropist in Russia. He was a critic of Vladimir Putin's, and as we all know, as I said, he is incarcerated today for one thing and one thing only, being a critic of Vladimir Putin's. That's really why he's in prison. Well, the reason I'm standing here and such a strong proponent of the action that we're about to take is that after I had met with Mr. Kartakovsky in Moscow, he sat in my office right upstairs here in the Rules Committee. And in that meeting that I had with him, Mr. Kartakovsky, great philanthropist, one of the wealthiest people in Russia, said to me, I'm concerned about my safety and well-being. I think that there might be action taken against me. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm embarrassed to say that my reaction was to laugh at him. I said, there's no way that a man of your stature doing the kinds of good things that you've been doing in Russia will face anything other than broad-based support. Mr. Speaker, I was wrong. The human rights violations which have taken place against Mikhail Khodorkovsky and a wide range of other people are one of the other reasons that we are here, pushing very, very strongly for permanent normal trade relations to force Russia to do something that they may not want to do, and that is to live with a rules-based trading system. The other name that leads us here, of course, is Sergei Magnitsky, a young lawyer, a young lawyer who was simply raising questions, a so-called whistleblower, a whistleblower who was beaten to death three years ago tomorrow. Tomorrow marks the third anniversary of Sergei Magnitsky's death, and it is outrageous, it is outrageous, Mr. Speaker, that this kind of action in this 21st century still exists in a country that claims to be a democracy. It is horrendous and it is unacceptable. And that's why I believe coupling the permanent normal trade relations for Russia and Moldova along with the Magnitsky language. And I want to congratulate our colleagues Ben Cardin and John Kyle and I know that my colleague Mr. McGovern has been involved in pushing this. I, I, I strongly support the effort that we have had that will ensure that those who are responsible for Sergei Magnitsky's tragic, brutal beating, which led to his death three years ago tomorrow, will be followed and be brought to justice. And so, Mr. Speaker, this is a, a great bipartisan effort. It's one that I think will inure to the benefit of the people of Russia and the people of the United States. And I'd like to say that, remember, we're not giving up a thing. We're not lowering a single tariff. There's not a single sacrifice that's being made here in the United States of America. What we're doing is we're breaking down the barriers there. Last year, we exported $11 billion, $11 billion to Russia. The projection is that by 2017, our exports will be $22 billion, twice what we had to say, and there are a number who anticipate that they'll go actually beyond that. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that uh, this is a win-win all the way around. It's a win for the cause of human rights. It's a win for the cause of those of us, Democrats and Republicans alike, who want to create good American jobs so that we can have access to 142 million consumers. And it's a win for the people of Russia, who deserve better than they've gotten, and through the U.S. access to that market, will have an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, an opportunity to see their standard of life and quality of life improve. Because I believe passionately in the interdependence of economic and political liberalization. This accession of the WTO will enhance economic liberalization, and it will create an opportunity, I hope and pray, for the kind of political reform that is desperately needed. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time.